Uh, I am so grateful to, first of all, all, all of you who have come, particularly to the people who have traveled from the four corners of the world to join the panels. It, it is a, an all-star cast that, that the conveners and the prize committee have assembled, and there are many dimensions <coughs> to the honor that I'm receiving, but perhaps the most significant is the character of the people who have come to help us celebrate this occasion, and I'm very grateful. I thought I, I'd start by <coughs> picking up a theme that, with which I ended the introduction to my last book, and that is the question of how we should understand the relation between two bodies of ideas, on the one hand, law, and on the other hand, morality. As you saw from Stephen's quick agenda, the, the, that is an issue. The connection between law and morality is an issue with which we will be concerned in different ways all day. There is a classic way of understanding the question, what is the connection between law and morality? <clears throat> that classic way supposes, as I said a moment ago, that we begin with two bodies of thought, with two sovereign areas. On the one hand, we have law, which is essentially, in the main, made by human beings in one way or another. And then we have, as a separate set of ideas, morality, which is independent of the desires of men. Human beings can make various things illegal, but they can't change what is moral and immoral by fire. The question therefore arises, what is the connection, or what are the connections between these two distinct bodies of ideas, and many theories have been developed. In our time, I would suppose, there are three main answers to this question of the connection. The first is the answer given by the theory, sometimes called legal positivism, in Scandinavia called Scandinavian legal realism, and that body of thought, very influential from the 19th century on to the present day, holds that there is no connection between law and morals, at least in the following way. Of course, when human beings decide what law to make, they should try and make good law. They should respect moral imperatives in making law. But when we ask the question, what is the law on some particular subject? Does somebody who breaks a contract, <coughs> is someone who breaks a contract legally obliged to pay damages or not in the particular circumstances of the case? According to the positivist tradition, that is a matter to be settled by looking only to law and by divining the character or the content of law only by looking at what human beings have decided in the past. The second great tradition, the natural law tradition, has many different, again, versions, but we might summarize all of these by saying there is the following connection Morality operates as a veto over the kind of law there can be. To put it in the crude formulation often used, an immoral law or a truly immoral law is no law at all. So again, you have the idea of these two separate bodies of opinion, but different from the positivist tradition, the claim is that there is a connection, a connection which to some degree makes the content of law dependent on the content of morality. The third kind of view, a view that 
that I've tried to defend over the last few decades is often said to lie somewhere between the two. I have argued that the body of law includes not just the discrete rules made by human beings, legislatures and judges and so forth, but includes also the principles that supply the best justification of that body of law, so that there is a dense interconnection of substance between the two. These are the way, I think, that the classic theories, or some of them, might be seen if we begin with this picture of law and morality as two separate domains. It's in some ways a simple picture. It's been very appealing. It's dominated legal theory. It has one enormous and, in my view, fatal flaw. And that is that there is, in fact, no third body of opinion, no third set of ideas to which we can remit the question what is the connection between law and morality? We can't treat that question, the classic question of jurisprudence, we can't treat that as a legal question without begging the question, nor can we treat it as a moral question without begging the question. Whichever way we begin to approach this classic issue, we begin too far along because we're supposing already a kind of connection. I would like, therefore, to propose that we begin with a very different model in mind. Instead of seeing law and morality as two independent sets of ideas, which might or might not be connected in various ways, interdependent in various ways, we try to understand law as a department of morality, as embedded within morality right from the start. We're used to distinctions in the grand scheme of value. We're used to distinctions, for example, between aesthetics and morality, between ethics, which is the study of how to live well, and morality more narrowly conceived, which is the study of how we ought to treat other people, how we must treat other people. Within the domain more narrowly conceived of morality, we're used to a distinction between personal morality and political morality. We take questions about the distribution of a community's wealth, questions of political distributive justice to belong to a separate department from the department that governs how you as individuals ought or ought not to be generous to other people. We have, we have divisions within morality, not airtight, but for practical purposes, and we can distinguish further, not just personal and political morality, but within each department. I, we distinguish questions, for example, of distributive justice from other questions of political morality. We speak of the morality of promise-keeping, for example, as a separate sub-classification of morality. My suggestion is that we should think of law as a department of morality, so that the question, the old question, what is the connection between law and morality, is superseded from the start. It's not a question we any more ask. Now, in order to make this plausible, I would have to show how we can build up this separate domain of morality by showing it to be embedded in more general principles of fairness. And I think this can be done. Stephen won't allow me uh, a very long time to do it, 
But Ten let's more just. <laughs> no, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> four, <laughs> four, if you like. <laughs> just. No, I have ten actually. Keep now. going. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> now, imagine a family. An older sister, Kate, and her younger brother, Johan. Kate has promised to take Johan to the zoo this afternoon, but she gets a call from a boy she's been anxious to see, and he proposes a date. And the question is whether, in all fairness, Kate can simply ignore Johan, who begins to cry. Kate's mother, Anna, must decide this question. And now let's think about the dimensions that the quest dimensions of complexity that this rather simple domestic incident might raise. Anna, the mother, presumably thinks this isn't the only time when I'll be asked when a promise may be broken. So I better decide on principle, and I better have an eye to other arguments of this kind that will come up later, because if I simply decide, as I feel justice would require in this case, I might be embarrassed later. And fairness requires that I treat like cases alike. And, and by the way, it now occurs to me that I made a decision last year in somewhat comparable circumstances. I ought, therefore, to keep faith with the past by attempting to see what principle I must have been relying on in the past. It might also be, and let it, let it be so, that this family has a kind of family code. And this code has been accumulated over generations in what looks like the following way. It looks as if whatever the oldest living member of the family lays down is to be respected. And, and uh, Kate finds in this family rule book, she finds to her great pleasure that uh, her great-great-grandfather once said, promises need not be kept if they are too onerous. She brings forward this rule book. And now Anna has a lot of other questions. The first question is, should this tradition be continued? That's not a yes-no question. Yes, it should be continued. Fairness would seem to require that. People have been relying on this. But what exactly is this tradition? For example, what is the scope of the claim? What is the scope of the power? Does, could the eldest living ancestor invent anything he might or she might want to? Are there limits on this? Also, striking questions of interpretation arise at once. Who decides what is too onerous? Do we re try and retrieve what the ancestor who laid down the rule regarded as onerous? He might have had a different view about the importance of dating from the contemporary view. Do we remit the question to the popular opinion within the family at the time? Or do we, do we regard this as a question simply to be answered by considering the concept of onerous burden itself? You, I think, have the idea. That is, that by exploring each dimension of a rather simple domestic problem, we see that issues of fairness considered apart from the formal institutions we are used to generate questions isomorphic with the questions that legal philosophers and indeed practicing and academic lawyers face. And I suggest to you that we can see the development of law over time, not as many legal philosophers have seen it, as the sudden appearance of an entirely new phenomenon as a kind of continuity shift, but simply as beginning in power and then responding to arguments of fairness 
about power. Now, if we adopted this new paradigm, if we gave up the two sovereigns view of law and morality, and instead saw all of these questions as internal to a department of morality, a great deal else would change. And I'll just suggest at the beginning of this discussion what other changes I think might flow. I think we would reconceive the whole question of political obligation, or as it sometimes put, the obligation to obey the law. Instead of that being a question we ask once law is in place, it's a question we ask in deciding as we go through the structure of decision that I meant to illustrate with the domestic example, what the law actually is. The question of political obligation becomes in that way an internal legal question. We reconstruct the different familiar theories of law, legal positivism, natural law, some theory that relies on the virtue of integrity. We reconstruct these as the consequence of accepting one or another account of the basic principles of political morality. We see positivism as flowing not from some theory about the very meaning of legal terms, or worse, the very concept of law. We see positivism as a network of ideas flowing from a commitment to certain political values, the values of predictability, or differently conceived, the values of democracy under one understanding of what democracy is. And we see natural law and indeed constitutionalism as rising from one set of answers to the questions of fairness that appear when we begin by asking what scope should authority have? The kind of question, for example, that the Israeli Supreme Court asked without benefit of a constitution and imposed, as it were, from inside legal morality, a constitutional structure limiting the power of the Knesset. One ad further advantage of this, one particular advantage of seeing the positivist tradition, not as coming from a theory about what concepts mean, but as coming from a commitment to certain basic ideas of political morality, is that we gain for positivism something that it has thus far lacked, which is a theory of how to decide hard cases. We dispense with the idea of discretion, this catch-all, this hole in the donut idea, and we allow judges drawn to a general positivist stance to understand that they are committed by their theory of law to the ascendancy of just those particular political virtues, and that therefore, when hard cases come that aren't decided, obviously, by the enactments of past statesmen, that they consult the intentions of past statesmen in the service of whatever theory of democracy they suppose to supply the engine of their positivism. I think that can be done for each of the classic theories. I think the result of approaching the legal philosophy as a branch of moral philosophy rather than, and in particular, political philosophy, rather than an independent subject all on its own, simply and, in my view, dramatically improves the richness of the subject. And anyway, it's good to break the mold now and again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.